ingredients like the butter and the milk and, and vanilla and things like that. And then you conch it for a very long time. And the amount of conching um, and how long it is conched uh, determines how smooth the chocolate is. So it's a really, really long involved process to create uh, our favorite um, dessert food, chocolate. So the fermentation, as I said, um, is typically standardized to be two-step. Um, if you don't store it well, and if you don't sterilize it, it can actually go through additional fermentation process, which is bad and it could cause um, off flavors. So um, in typical chocolate processing, they try to standardize it to be just two steps. And these are the two steps where the first, the sugars of the cocoa beans are used by yeast to produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. Um, and lactic acid also uses the residual sugars to create lactic acid. Um, and then the acetic acid bacteria uses the ethanol that is produced by the yeast to create acetic acid. And through these process, a lot of the aromatics are formed because the um, big uh, molecules are broken down through the whole fermentation process. And then you get this really rich, wonderful flavor with a little tartness um, in chocolate. So that was the story of the chocolate, but we were so supposed to talk about stinky cheese, right? <laughs> a little bit of it. So let's move to cheese, uh, the second poll. On average, about how much cheese does an American consume per year? One person. So one person per year, how much do you think uh, people consume? One kilogram, five kilogram, 10 kilogram, 15 kilogram, 50 kilogram. It will really widely uh, depend on the person. If you like cheese, you consume more probably. And if you don't like cheese, you consume less. I used to not consume much cheese until I grew an appreciation and uh, now I consume a lot of cheese. So you can also kind of change over time too. So now we have about 60% participated. We get some wide varying answers here. <laughs> I think you guys are on the right track. <laughs> All right, 76 participated. So maybe we can end poll and share the poll. All right, so as you can see, 42% uh, said 15 kilogram, 37% said 50, whopping 50 kilograms. Um, that's kind of my, I shouldn't expose it, but it's almost as much as I am. But anyway, <laughs> that's kind of like my weight. <laughs> and then um, 10 kilogram, 21% uh, people said it. And the answer is on average, about 15 kilograms. So good for you. 50% of you guys got the correct answer. All right. So if you look at this, um, and this is 2006, so it could have changed um, since people eat more now. In fact, especially through the COVID situation, we may have eaten more. Um, this was published by the Institute of Food Technologists, IFT. Um, and this is per person, per year consumption. As you can see, cheese, 14 kilogram. And look right above it, beer, whopping 100 liter. I'm like, what? Did I read it wrong? But per person per year, Americans consume 100 liter of beer. Wow, that is a lot of fluid. Mm. Anyway, so th these are the consumption level um, per person per year. Um, as you can see, uh, not much of the fermented vegetables are consumed. Um, only 2.8 kilogram compared to 14 kilogram of cheese. Um, and yogurt too, although it's still a dairy fermented product, people consume less, much less than cheese, um, only like 3.4 kilogram. Good news is not many people consume salami and prosciutto, a lot of salt there. So good to minimize that consumption. All right. So with that, what are some descriptors for cheese that you can think of? Share in the chat, like if you're you love cheese, and especially if you're also consuming the wedge salad, get a piece of uh, blue cheese and then um, perceive it and then write down what perceptions. Creamy, okay. Pungent, okay. What else? Nutty, okay, very good. Or you can even think of from other 
um, cheeses that you have consumed before. Salty, sweet, definitely salty, definitely sweet, nutty. Okay, gooey, yes, okay. Gooey, especially the mozzarella cheese on pizza, very gooey. Mm -hmm. A delicious, okay. <laughs> that's a that's an opinion, not a descriptor. Uh, I'll just say uh, when we ask human um, instruments to report on their perception, there's one category of hedonics where you're reporting on, oh, delicious, wonderful, great, I love it. Versus the descriptors were more analytical and were like trying to decipher what your um, perceiving. Oh, there's interesting ones, stretchy and bouncy and velvety. It seems like you are all like entering very like positive descriptors. These are some cheese descriptors that you can find describing some of the cheeses. Barnyardy, yeasty, grassy, nutty, lavender, earthy, fruity, gamey, metallic, soapy, hmm, goaty, we have the goat, the painty. Actually, the painty is one of the key uh, descriptor for uh, blue cheese. And I didn't put it here, but some cheddar cheeses have very strong fecal aroma too. So those are some descriptors for you for cheese. It's very interesting. If you have your eyes closed and some very stinky cheese in front of you, you might be like confused of, okay, what am I smelling? Am I smelling like uh, sweaty socks, right? So why do we like cheese so much when there are these descriptors that obviously are very like offensive? <laughs> it is in fact all in our nose and our sense of smell. And that's where we're leading toward. Unlike the basic tastes, which we learn as the bitter, sour, salty, umami, and sweet. Appreciation for smell is actually learned. Basic taste, in fact, and I'm hoping Janina, the first uh, presenter last week, talked about a little bit of this, and if she hasn't, um, we're born to actually like some of the basic tastes and some of the tastes we are really not liking. So, for example, um, sweet and salty, we're born to appreciate, sweet especially, because a lot of the sweet substances that are sugars are energy sources for our body, so our uh, innate um, liking is to get the energy source. On the other hand, bitterness is innate dislike uh, basic taste because a lot of the poisonous compounds are bitter. And so there's a protective mechanism of our body to have a gag reflex um, if you get bitter uh, substance in your mouth. And you might have experienced when you have some medicine that was caught in your throat when you're little, and then you like had this uh, immediate gag reflex, and that's your body's protective mechanism. So the, these are innate preferences versus smell, it's not innate. And a lot of researchers actually have done research to show that. So if you put, and you, you don't want to, but if you put your uh, baby's dirty diaper next to it, they're gonna smell it. They're not gonna like wince or be unhappy about it. They're gonna be like, oh. They learn that that's a bad smell by looking at their parents' faces and they're like, mm, a stinky diaper. And you're, you're, you're changing it and you're like making this frowny face. And this is how they're learning that, oh, fecal smell, no good. My parents are like making this bad face. But when you give a bitter substance to baby, they will cry because it is an innate dislike sensation versus Sugar solutions are actually used in NICUs. And I know this because my son was in the NICU. And uh, unfortunately, a sensory scientist in me had found that, oh my God, they're using sugar solution to uh, placate, make the baby feel better before they do inv invasive uh, procedures on them. And I didn't know what that was until I asked, like, what are you putting on his tongue before you're like pulling out his tube and stuff? And they were saying, oh, it's just sugar solution. And so really it's an innate mechanism of enjoying the sweetness. So again, important, smell appreciation is learned. It is not uh, innate. So let's learn a little bit about smell, also known as olfaction. It's a chemical sense. In fact, chemical compounds need to dissolve in your olfactory epithelium and be in contact with the receptor protein to be detected. And so, because it's a chemical 
uh, compound interacting with receptor protein. It's also known as chemoreception. Um, and most of these chemical compounds obviously are volatile, airborne, in order for us to be detecting it. Um, where do we smell? We smell the in the nose, right? Um, the nasal cavity is in fact a cavity. It's really big in there. It's a huge cavity. There's a lot of head space. And the olfactory bulb actually extends from directly from your, your uh, brain. So it's like a direct extension from your brain. Um, and on the olfactory epithelium are all these olfactory uh, receptor cells that have hairy-like structure called cilia. And on the cilia part is where the olfactory re receptor proteins uh, are, are uh, located. Okay. Um, we usually think about smell as just sniffing and that the smell goes through our nostril up uh, via nasal. So that's like orthonasal sniffing smell. But in fact, most of our smells that we appreciate from our food comes retronasally. As you are chewing on your food, um, the volatiles come uh, back of the throat into your nasal cavity. So it's a retronasal uh, olfaction that you're actually perceiving more. And the way to demonstrate this, if you have any food in front of you, including the chocolate pudding or the, the salad dressing that you have, First, hold your nose. And if you have any food that you can grab, like candy or something, and usually in my class, when I do this demonstration, I bring Jolly Ranchers candy, and then I unwrap them and put it in a little cup. And I say, hold your nose, open up the cup with one hand, but do not uh, unhold your nose. And then I just hold my nose like this and I talk so that they know that you're supposed to hold your nose. And then take a bite of the food, so if you have chocolate pudding, chocolate pudding would be really good. Or the blue cheese. Take a bite of it and then see how it feels. See how it tastes. And even the Jolly Rancher that is so full of fruity flavor, students will say, huh, I don't know, a little bit of sweet, maybe a little sour. And then I say, release your nose. And then there's like a whole world of difference in what you perceive. And even the sweetness and sourness have out actually heightened so much. And that's the level of retronasal olfaction that we perceive. And this is why when you uh, have a cold and congested nose, your food does not taste so good. And it's all very bland, right? Because you, you have a blockage of that retronasal uh, olfaction. Um, in the past, people believed that we are able to smell through these different theories because we couldn't figure out what, what was at work. Uh, the first theory was like, oh, the actual molecules go puncture the, the olfactory uh, system here, and then they're detected. And then the next theory was that, oh, there is a certain vibration that chemical compounds have, and we're recognizing these different vibrations. And then the third theory was kind of close to what now we know um, is the lock and key theory of like enzyme and substrate of specific site theory. Um, and then recently proven um, through the seminal work by uh, Richard Axel and Linda Buck in 1991, um, the olfactory receptor proteins. And in fact, they won the 2004 Nobel Prize for this uh, in medicine and physiology. Uh, in fact, the olfactory um, receptor cells uh, they usually can perceive bind to a few different chemical compounds. Um, and then there's thousands of these, and this is why we can smell thousands of smells. And there's combination of different patterns that you can uh, recognize. That's the part that people are always questioning. After this, what happens in your brain? Because there are different parts of the brain that lights up with various smells. And so there's there must be some kind of a pattern recognition of certain olfactory receptor cells firing, and then they all light up different areas. And then that pattern lights up to be, oh, if this is a pattern, it's minty. If this is a pattern, it's uh, fecal. You know, like That's how people are recognizing. But that part is somewhat of a question mark. So again, there is no primary smells because there's thousands of smells. Um, 
like the primary taste exists. Uh, but in certain industries that really care about smells like the flavor or fragrance uh, industry or even wine industry, they have actually um, developed some categories of smells. And they also use different um, terminology and different industry actually uses different terminology. So I can't really say they're standardized, but this is a very nifty um, tool to have the wine aroma wheel. You can just like uh, Google it and find it. If you're a wine drinker, you can like whip it up and like, oh, I feel some earthy, surfery and some nutty and kerosene in this wine. Hmm. You know, like you can, you can use all these descriptors to describe your wine. Some general properties of olfaction, um, we can actually smell at much lower concentration of a chemical compound than taste. So there's a much uh, more heightened sensation of olfaction compared to the taste. Um, and then there's also a very fast adaptation. All of our senses get adapted with constant stimulus, but there's much more fast adaptation with uh, olfaction than the um, the taste. And this is kind of evidence when you go into a room where there was a lot of people, like a classroom, let's say, and maybe it's a su summer, like hot summer day, and you go in, you're like, ooh, I smell the past class people's mm, smells um, sweaty and mm. And then you sit down and then you listen to the lecture for like five minutes and you no longer smell the room. Your, your sense has been adapted. That's kind of an example. But I wanted to give you an actual demonstration, which I can't give you in terms of the smell there. So I'm going to do a visual uh, adaptation. Let's stare at the four dots in the middle. You can blink. Don't, don't do a, like a staring contest where you like uh, tear up or anything. You can blink, but don't move your head. If you move your head, the effect goes away fairly quick, quickly. And then I go like, Phew. and then you're like, whoa, what do you see? Jesus, yes. You see Jesus, right? I have actually adapted your rod, which is your visual uh, sense of light and darkness. The dark part has been adapted to dark. So now it's going to fire light, light, light. And the light part will fire dark, dark, dark. And that's why you see the reverse. And you're like, whoa, Jesus. And that's your rod, your visual receptor cell getting adapted. Okay. So that's an example demonstration of adaptation, all right? And I do a lot of these illusions in one of my vision class and students are like, okay. And I say, be careful walking out. You, you're gonna see some flashing things for like about 10 minutes. <laughs> it, it will go away, I promise. The adaptation usually goes away once the stimulus is gone. <laughs> all right, so that's more, uh, another uh, property of olfaction, adaptation. And then there's also mixture interaction that's going on. And this is when we take out the Glade or Febreze or candles. That's we're masking our room odor with floral or foody scent. So like you cook fish and then, okay, I don't want my uh, house to smell fishy. So I turn on the candle and mask it, suppress it using uh, foody and, and floral. Um, there's also release from this suppression effect. So if you have mixture of odors, all of the odors will actually suppress each other, obviously, because that's a, a fundamental masking suppression effect. Uh, but if you actually smell one of them before smelling the mixture, you release the other's odors. And I explain it this way and people are like, huh, what are you talking about? So I'm gonna give you a complex graph to explain this. Okay, so you have the vanillin as a, a certain concentration of solution. What do you think this will smell like? Obviously, vanillin, vanilla, yes, mm, very smart. What about cinnamon aldehyde? What do you think this will smell like? This is another solution. Cinnamon, yes, okay. So you have the vanillin solution and on the y-axis is mean perceived intensity. So panel, uh, rated as average eight. And then you had the cinnamic aldehyde solution panel rated at around 15. They were individual. When you mix them together because of the suppression effect, you will have both of them decrease. So the mixture you can see with the suppression effect, 
vanil uh, vanilla aroma decreased to like five, like half, and then uh, cinnamon aroma decreased to around 12 from 15. Now, if you smell the mixture after you smell cinnamic aldehyde, so the original solution, you smell cinnamon, and then you smell the mixture, what happens is the vanilla aroma gets back to its original intensity, and that's the release from mixture suppression effect. And then the same thing, if you smell the vanillin and then you smell the mixture, then the cinnamon aroma goes back to its original intensity. And that's, again, the release from mixture suppression effect. And you may see in like bath and body workshops and things of that nature where they set, sell a lot of uh, aromatic uh, products, random coffee beans lying around. Have you seen that? That is actually to trigger this mixture, release from mixture suppression effect and, and perfume counter, yes. You smell the coffee beans, which are very aromatic in various different aromas, but not necessarily the products that the, the shop is selling. Like it's not very floral or fruity. So then you suppress all of the coffee bean aroma and then it, accentuates the floral and the fruity smell of their products that they're selling. And so it's kind of a rinse in a way, but that's, that's the effect that they're, they're um, caring for there. So those are uh, some properties. And then the last two, again, I mentioned that thousands of smells are recognized and identified, right? And smell is very closely related to our emotion and, and memory. It's direct extension of the uh, brain I, I mentioned, and it is a direct extension of your frontal lobe where emotion and memory resides. And so what aromas trigger emotion and memory for you? Could it be like grilled cheese and tomato soup may trigger some emotion or memory like, oh, mom, or pumpkin pie, because usually it's uh, consumed in holiday, or could it be ratatouille? You know, there's that very uh, important scene in this wonderful Pixar short film that I love. The critic uh, asks for this very simple, humble dish of ratatouille and he, he bites it and then instantly he's flashed back into his house where he falls off his bike, he's sad, and then his mom makes the ratatouille for him and he's like, oh, so happy. And he just remembers it instantaneously as he bites into it with the aromatics that he is enjoying. And that's the aroma uh, that triggering emotion and memory. Um, and that's so depicted so well in that uh, the movie. So in the chat, tell me what kind of food or aromas uh, that you really enjoy and that triggers memory or emotion for you. You can write the, the food itself. You can write the aroma. Smell after rain. Ooh, that, I love that. Yeah. Sweet potato pie. Fried mustard seeds. Yes. Cologne from my first girl. Oh my goodness. <laughs> See? <laughs> and you even remember it. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Anyone else, any memories or uh, emotions? Elementary school cafeteria smell. Oh, is that a good one or a bad one? <laughs> I hope it's a good one that you loved elementary school and your friends. <laughs> Mustache wax, bread it smell, <laughs> crackling fire. I love fires. It always gives me good like warmth and uh, fun time because you go to campfire and then you have the bonfire, right? Uh, what else? Mustache wax. That's very interesting. Hmm. Grilling. Yes. Grilling also gives you that summery vibe and um, getting together with family and friends, right? Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. Oh, sunscreen. <laughs> You're actually giving us a really good, interesting ones like the, the cologne and the sunscreen. <laughs> Dry pine needles. Ooh, smell from a new graphic novel. You're, you are all very creative in uh, trigger, having these trigger smells that you can describe. Ah, uh, yeah, sunscreen smell, always like swimming pool and summertime ocean. Wonderful, love it. Okay, so yes, we are all able to smell thousands of smell and appreciation for smell is learned behavior. It's not innate. 
And smells are tied to emotions and memories and culture. So we can embrace and appreciate the diversity of olfaction as we embrace the world and culture around us. And I love this picture, by the way, with all the food and diversity of all the food and it's really nice. So that is it for me today to talk to you about various topics. In fact, we came from wine to fermentation to cheese to aroma and olfaction. And then I am open for any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Sue, for that fun and engaging talk. I certainly got a lot from it. And I'm sure the um, rest of us feel the same way. So thank you again. My pleasure. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm going to stop sharing so maybe we could um, see the, maybe I can see the whole gallery view here of people. Okay. Oh, and then there's a <laughs> reminder for the feedback. <laughs> yes. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad Catherine said she enjoyed the lunch, delicious lunch and the presentation. <laughs> So, Sue, so I, I have a question. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was very curious. I didn't know that you you learn olfaction, and it's not something that was like the, in in you, like innate, like reaction. So, um, does it change with with age, or are there any differences? Because this is not something that you grow with it, but it's like I guess that because your brain changes. Does it change the perception, for instance, with, with age? Sure, yeah. Um, I think uh, your great question. I think there are uh, two parts in the question. So the learning of olfaction that I was talking about is mainly on the appreciation of different smells. Um, in fact, actually, your olfactory system develops after you're born. So. Um, up to like six months to a year. So uh, the babies actually grow to sense more smells as they grow older and older. But after like one year, I think your olfactory system is uh, fully uh, developed. So your sensitivity is there. Um, with age, with any cell, regeneration is, uh, it will get slower and slower. So you do lose more than you retain or you regenerate. So your sense of smell and taste will decline in terms of the sensitivity. So that's one part of the answer with aging. Um, in terms of appreciation, yes, you would definitely grow with different types of um, appreciation as you are exposed more and you enjoy more and you try more. Um, you could find smells that uh, before was very foreign um, and um, not familiar to be familiar and then you enjoy it. So one example that I have, and of course, this is my personal example is I used to really not like cilantro. I would have even said, I hate cilantro. I cannot tolerate cilantro. Now I love it, but it took me um, 15 years. So <laughs> it took me quite a bit of long time. I mean, there are some uh, unfamiliar smells that I can get used to right away, but uh, there are also smells that I, it takes a long time for me to grow to appreciate. So that's another uh, answer in terms of appreciation. You can grow to appreciate it. Thank you. We have a couple questions in the chat. The first one we got in was, um, can you talk a bit about emotional memory associated with food? Ah, yes. Um, so I, I'm not an expert in this area, but uh, what I've known is, and usually the um, research is done on food aversions. So uh, when there is a food that is tied to traumatic experience, then you develop uh, the psychological uh, barrier and it's real. And that in fact, when you see the food or smell the food or even think about the food, you have a gag reflex or like you have some um, uh, physical response to it. Um, and so there could be that emotional tie. Um, in terms of the good, you know, food is always, um, for me especially been uh, associated with friends, family, good, you know, and, and for the most people, 
um, food is because it is a uh, substance that we need to survive is a good thing. And so there's that good part of it um, that is associated with good emotion, but the research is mainly done on the um, traumatic experience part of it. Thank you. Um, we, we have another one here. Uh, why is olfaction not an innate sense like taste is? Is there an evolutionary benefit? That's a really good question, um, which I don't know the answer to. Why is olfaction not innate? I would think that because smelling something um, is not as uh, direct impact on our health than eating something, like ingesting something. And so that uh, taste mechanism and innate sense of uh, liking or disliking for energy source versus poison is a very important barrier. It's a gate uh, versus the aroma, especially because it's also uh, ubiquitous and it's flowing. You can't have a real control over it. With tasting, you have direct control over it. It's something that you have to directly put it in your mouth versus aroma. You can just exist in a room and it's just gonna come to you, right? You can't you can't block it in any way. So maybe that is why um, that it's not as innate as taste. Um, I know that with there and uh, there's a phenomena that in, I didn't talk about with uh, olfaction is called an anosmia, and you probably heard this through COVID situation, COVID anosmia. Um, it's a uh, general property of olfaction. Um, and some people might be specific anosmics and they don't realize it because they've not been tested. Um, there are uh, many smells that uh, could be specifically not be smelling by a certain group of people. Um, but anosmia is like inability to smell. And so for those people, um, there's issues if you're working in a certain industry, for example, like army or like construction site, because there needs to be a keen sense of smell for let's say chemical or, or some uh, issues that they might have to like detect right away or gas, right? So um, that is in fact important. Um, I don't know in the the history of evolution of humans that if it was as important as uh, gatekeeping the ingestion. Interesting. Yeah, this maybe this will follow up the answer to the next question listed that some, um, uh, one of our participants says, I always say I can't smell anything, especially some foul smells like skunks and stuff, but obviously I can smell some things. Can you explain why maybe some people can smell certain smells better than other people? Or maybe is it related to exposure? Uh, so yes, I think uh, Murray, um, I think you might be specifically anosmic to skunky because skunky is a smell that uh, creates specific anosmics, fishy, sweaty, urinous, these are some, and I, when I uh, tell this to my student, I, students, I say, I wish I was specific anosmic to these very off aromas. I wouldn't want to smell it, but um, you might be actually specifically an anosmic to those foul smells. So maybe you should be thankful. <laughs> and it's not a, so being able to smell something is not a learned behavior. That's innate, it's in the genetics. Anosmics are in the genetics other than the COVID situation. Oh, and there's also general anosmics where, who can't smell anything. So it's really sad as you did the retronasal um, demonstration, they're kind of living in a black and white world of uh, taste and smell because they can't smell anything. That really rarely happens. And it's usually caused through uh, accidents or trauma to the olfactory. Um, uh, bulb or or genetics. So really, it's it's a really rare case for general anosmia to happen. And then, of course, we know that COVID causes it. So fascinating. Um, we have another question. Uh, is it known if there is variability in which smell receptors for quantities slash distribution of different receptors are present from person to person? Oh. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm 
sure there's probably answer to that in the literature. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can say is in terms of taste buds, uh, there are. So uh, there's a uh, research that developed in terms of probe, uh, which is 6N2 uh, thiouracil, I think. Um, and, and a propyl thiouracil, that's why it's prop. Um, and that is a medication that is used for Graves' disease treatment, but at a very low dosage, um, you can actually test for people who can taste it or not. And this is also genetics. It's not something that you can learn to taste or not, but they can taste it eventually at a very, very high concentration. But at the low dosage, there's distinct population that can taste it or not. And it has shown that people who are probe non-tasters um, have much less number of taste buds and dense uh, receptor cells in the taste buds or the papillae. So, mm -hmm. which then uh, relates to sensitivity issues. So they're less sensitive in terms of taste. Um, so I know that for the taste, but I do not know if there's actually a huge variation in terms of smell receptors, a number of them. I actually have a question. Oh, here we have, we have another one. Oh, we have a, 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 my quick question for you is earlier you said, um, you used a word, I could be, I, maybe I misheard you, but you were talking about um, descriptions of, smells so there's like or description of tastes i'm sorry if i'm getting this incorrect and there's one category that's like the taste receptors and there's another category and you said it's something that sounded like edonics that was about like how much you like something what is that word how do you spell oh, that <laughs> hedonics h-e-d-o-n-i-c hedonic it's okay. like it's a it's a same word um same meaning different word uh in terms of liking Oh, interesting. Nonics. Yeah. Okay, cool. And cool. so in the field of sensory science that I'm in, um, we use human subjects um, as instruments. And you can use the instrument as analytical tool to have all these descriptors for different products. But you can use human instruments as consumers because, in, in fact, we are consumers of goods. And so you might just want their opinion and liking. And we call that a hedonic testing, liking mm -hmm. testing, acceptability testing. And the scale that we used is called nine point hedonic scale. It's nine point liking scale, Likert scale. So that goes from extremely dislike to extremely like. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have one person that's. Uh, um, sad about their dislike of cilantro and they're asking, how did you change your taste of it? <laughs> yes, and uh, in fact, cilantro uh, smell taste has been described as soapy. And in fact, it's genetics that you smell it that way. And in fact, I smell it that way, that it's genetics. But now I have grown to appreciate it. And when you first encountered it in food, you're like, whoa, why does my soup smell like soap? And you wouldn't want to eat it. And this is why I didn't like it very much. Um, but as you grow to appreciate it in a context of certain food, um, I first started really enjoying um, and I thought, oh, this is a must uh, herb in salsa. So when I didn't put cilantro in it, it just didn't feel right. It did, and no matter how much pepper I would put in or whatever, it just didn't feel like the right salsa, the authentic salsa. And so I appreciate it there in that context. And then a little bit of summer roll, and then, and then a little bit of soup. You know, I got to grow to appreciate little bit by little bit in, in expanding the context of food in which I enjoy cilantro. I don't put it in all still, obviously. <laughs> it is one of those very potent ones. Um, but I love it in fall. I love it in um, any of the Vietnamese stir fry or Thai stir fry. So yeah. And growing appreciation, there's a theory because I do a little bit of uh, research on picky eating. Um, and there's a theory that multiple exposure eventually gets people to like it. Maybe not always 100%, but uh, the magic number that people use for kids and picky eating phenomena is eight to 10 exposures. And usually people give up, like the parents give up, you know, when your, your kid says no to broccoli or spinach like three times and they're like, okay, I'm not gonna cook broccoli again and like fail to 
uh, have this little one ingested. Um, but the magic number they give is eight to 10 times. I think it depends on the food, in fact, and how potent the smell might be. And again, it took me 15 years to appreciate cilantro, so. <laughs> um. We have a question here. Uh, what about COVID causing someone to smell foul odors when there are none present? Um, is there anything, yeah, you can expand on that? Um, I, I have not heard of it. There might be that report. Um, if, if it happens, it's very obvious that COVID causes destruction in the um, olfactory system um, somehow. And it's a direct offense to the system, it seems like. So if it can cause anosmia, uh, maybe it could actually cause some uh, malfunction to smell differently. If it is uh, selectively killing certain receptors, I'm, I doubt it is, but if it does, then, then the pattern that you recognize might be different, even mm -hmm. though the smell is, you know, um, the volatiles that you're actually um, interacting with is the same because you're unable to have some of the receptors uh, fire up. But that's just my guess. Don't, don't take my word for it. Thank you. Um, and we have, uh, how do alterations to your body like pregnancy affect your sense of taste and smell? Oh, yes. So good question. Um, because when you're pregnant, you really are caring for not just one, but two people, uh, very precious, right? So you actually get a huge heightened sensitivity. So pregnant women uh, have reported smelling something that nobody can smell, like the human pheromones, or like, uh, and, and, um, and also like have a very different heightened sense of smell um, and taste. So it, it does happen, and it's been reported in the literature. I personally can say that, uh, as I mentioned, kimchi is one of my favorite fermented foods, and I cannot live without it. Um, but when I was pregnant with my first one, I could not eat kimchi for like the first five months. I could not even look at it. And then the, the last five months, I washed everything off and just ate the washed like Napa cabbage portion of it. And that was still <laughs> kind of really strong. So obviously my sense of smell um, heightened and also it changed in terms of appreciation. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the questions and thank you again, Sue, for that wonderful talk. Um, Kiptare just posted the survey link, so please fill that out before you leave today. Um, and our next lunchbox is November 17th, so be on the lookout for that registration. Link. Well, thank you all. I had really a uh, great time. Yeah, and if there's anyone who has um, any other questions, Elisa, that sends to you all, um, feel free to send it to me and I'll try to answer it as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great, it seems like um, a lot of people like the lunch and the presentation, so I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, give the presentation.